Over time, as the channel has grown, some persons have asked me why I don't start doing product reviews. Yet other persons have said that they appreciate that I don't do product reviews nor try to sell them stuff on this channel. I thought it might be a good moment to just sit back and talk about why I frankly don't do product reviews and I don't try to sell you stuff. So grab yourself a cup of tea or coffee, whatever you prefer, and take it easy because let's just have a talk about astrophotography gear and know that this is a video I've been meaning to get around to making for quite some time. So when I started the Sky Story channel, I never really thought it was going to be a big thing. It's nearly 10,000 subscribers now, and I know that's small in the YouTube world, but it's a fair size for the relatively small community that is astrophotography. When I originally started the channel, I was just sharing my love of astronomy and astrophotography, and then my early videos went boom! One of the first videos I posted, I think it's sitting around 115,000. I, I haven't looked in a long time, but a lot of a lot of views just right off the bat. And so the channel began to grow. It, it grew by almost a thousand subscribers within a couple weeks. And around that time, I had started building the observatory and I had honestly just created the channel to share with friends my love of astronomy and share how I was going about building the observatory. But the channel grew and grew and grew. Initially, there was some early, I'll call it hostility from a few people, certainly not the majority, but some hostility toward the simplicity of strategies that I was using to build the observatory. And in particular, my preference for layer-based photo editors to develop astrophotography. But by and large, I ignored those and just carried on. And without ever a focus on the channel really growing, the channel just kept growing. And for that, I am deeply grateful to all of you who have taken an interest in my work. And to me, not doing product reviews and not trying to shill products to you, it's a form of respect. Now, to be very frank with you, if I got hold of a product and I really believed in it, I would absolutely share that with you. Which is why I've made many videos on the use of Affinity Photo 2 and Photolab 8 and occasionally even PixInsights and other software. The stuff that I find that is very helpful, I share with you. Over the years, I've used reflector and refractor telescopes, and I have a particular fondness for reflector telescopes, especially Schmidt Cassegrain's. And I've certainly recommended them plenty in previous videos. Never really done a products review, but it is something that I use. I find very useful, very flexible, a very powerful tool. So absolutely, I'd recommend it. Now, long before I started doing the channel, I was doing astrophotography even when I was a little kid and astrophotography was a very experimental thing. A few people strapping cameras, film cameras yet, onto telescopes. I was, due to my love of astronomy, dipping my toes into the ocean of astrophotography. Now my family was poor. I grew up in the wilds of the rural backwaters. And so when I determined to go to college, I had a small scholarship, but mostly I had to pay my own way. And I earned a part of my way by shooting photography. Shooting professionally was never something I planned to do all the time, but I enjoyed it and it helped me make a living. So I invested both time and money in the serious study of art and photography and managed to make some money on the side doing something that I love. But what I really love is photographing the natural world. And as anybody who's ever tried their hand at it knows, there isn't a lot of money in it. You do it because you're passionate about it. Probably the same by and large with astrophotography. And like many new photographers, there was a period in time, it lasted several years, where I got caught up in equipment fever. Always looking for that better camera, that better lens that would give me the edge and make my photos stand out. But the old pros that I knew, the guys who had been doing photography for a full-time living, they all kept telling me not to spend so much money on gear and focus on using my eye and my heart. Put your heart into your photos. Do what you love, they said. And that image will be spectacular because it'll reflect your subject and you. Related, though it's not going to seem so, I was once out in the bush with a friend who is a retired SAS officer and I was harvesting some wild fungi. Among other things, I teach the identification of wild edible and medicinal mushrooms. But the knife that I had wasn't great and I was lamenting not having brought along a better one since we were finding so much. And he said, you know, the best knife is the one you have on you. It was experiences like that that really shaped my very practical attitude toward not just life in general, but to photography of all kinds. It's not about the equipment, it's what you have and how you use it. You don't have to buy the best of the best. In fact, in the world of professional photography, professional photographers use 
good equipment, good cameras, be they still image cameras or video cameras, use good cameras and good lenses, but they aren't taking out a mortgage to buy the absolute so-called best of the best because the simple fact is the majority of the people can't tell the difference and they don't care. And here's the real rub. There have been a number of double blind studies in which images shot with cameras of moderate expense versus images shot with cameras of extreme expense have been taken and even the so-called experts could not tell the one from the other. On a side note, some people have asked about my odd accent. Yes, I live in Canada and my family is of a French background. For them, French was their first language. However, I learned English as a first language, but I lived in a French community. My English probably has just a little bit of a French twang, hence the oddness of the accent. But being from a French family, we made wine. I mean, I, I was making wine since before I was a teenager. And I've always been interested in that process too. It can be very laissez-faire and it can be very exacting. And one of the interesting things that have come out of these double-blind studies is the so-called wine connoisseurs, the ones who are the real world experts in wine. In double-blind tests, they couldn't tell a cheap $20 bottle of wine from a $1,000 bottle of wine. Heck, a lot of the time, they couldn't even tell a white wine from a red wine. Now, how does this apply to astrophotography? Well, the reality is you do not have to break the bank to shoot good astrophotography. You need good equipment. But my advice to you is don't get caught up in equipment fever. Don't buy and buy and buy the next telescope, the next filter, the next camera, thinking that's what is going to make your images better because that's not what's going to make your images better. And whether or not you're using tip top of the line equipment or equipment that's moderately priced and decent, even the so-called experts, the experts among the experts are not likely to be able to tell. And that's why I don't spend my time on this channel doing product reviews and trying to get you to buy things you don't need. And frankly, when it comes to optics, any decent telescope is going to give you incredible performance these days. I mean, our technology, our capacity to produce good optics has come so far. Whether it's a reflector with a nice, really wide aperture or a good refractor, almost any decently made telescope is going to give you superb optics. Even a couple of decades ago, telescopes could not come to the quality they're at now. And you start going back 50, 60 years, I mean, nowhere close. So determine what focal lengths you want to shoot at and get a decent telescope. Buy something in the middle range price range with a reputation for quality. For me, that was an 81 millimeter refractor from Williams Optics and an eight inch or 203 millimeter Schmidt Cassegrain telescope from Celestron. And once you have that gear, you're set perhaps for life, unless you decide to do something specialized that actually needs different equipment. The same with cameras. You don't need the next latest camera. Sometimes there are real progressions in technology that are worth investing in. For example, the newer generation of camera sensors, say going back to about the Sony IMX500 series, have gotten rid of the need to shoot some kinds of calibration frames such as darks. They have improved their handling of electronic noise and they've gotten rid of other problems such as amp glow. Now to me, advancements like those definitely make it worth investing in a new camera. Those things will not only significantly simplify and quicken your workflow, but they can also have beneficial effects on your astrophotography. As an example, I've read many reports from persons struggling to remove amp glow from images. They use the proper techniques, but they say they can get a lot of it, but there's still a little scarring of the amp glow in the image. So new camera sensors that don't have such issues, yeah, I think they're worth it. But I would certainly recommend being careful when considering buying another camera because in some ways, photography has hit certain levels of peak technology. Digital photography has become so developed and so good that one doesn't need to run out and buy the latest tech every time there is a new development. That's actually been a problem within the camera industry, how to make significant new developments in order to motivate consumers to buy new equipment. Filters as well. Now, bear in mind when I talk about filters, I live at a dark sky site. It's probably around border 1.5 here. I don't have to deal with light pollution. I use LRGB for almost all my astrophotography, and sometimes I use narrow band for specific purposes, such as shooting some HA to really bring out the nebulosity within distant galaxies, or filtering in the S2 or O3 bands to add other types of accents to images. 
or to look for specific light frequencies in space, which may indicate the presence of certain materials. Because I don't just do astrophotography for fun, I also do it out of a love for science. Anyway, filters are very much the same issue. You get a good set of filters and stick with them, and they don't have to be bank-breaking filters. For example, these days I shoot almost exclusively in LRGB, and I'm just using CWO LRGB filters. CWO is mostly famous for the cameras and their harmonic drive mounts, and the parfocal LRGB filters are a bargain. It's about $289 Canadian for a full set. And comparatively speaking, even though these filters are quite affordable, they're more than adequate. They have a good reputation for being good filters, not the very best of the best, not the very best light transmission, but good filters. And with photographic equipment, that's often enough. And if you pop over to my Astrobin and take a look at the images there, pretty much every image that you see since the beginning of January 2024 was shot with those CWO LRGB filters. I could spend a lot of money to get a very slightly better set of filters with a, a percent or two, I guess, of better light transmission. But why bother? What's it really going to accomplish in the end? I am extremely pleased with the quality of the information that I have been obtaining through those filters. They're moderately priced yet solid quality, and that's enough. So what I'm saying is that, in my experience, professionals, unless they're working for a large studio with a virtually unlimited budget, get good equipment, say, on the high side of moderate, so the low side of very good. They don't keep buying more and more and more expensive equipment because good images are not the product of good equipment. The simple, unfortunate reality is a person can have the best equipment ever made and shoot absolutely terrible images. Or they can have only moderate equipment and shoot wonderful images. Because the quality of the images you get are about so much more than the cost of your equipment or even what kind of equipment you have. As long as your equipment is adequate for the job, good photography, you might say, comes from the heart. In the case of astrophotography, it's mostly about skill in choosing good targets, knowing how to manage factors such as moonlight and light pollution, having the patience to get adequate integration time, and especially, and I do mean especially above all, skill in development. And as long as you have decent, reliable equipment, that's enough. There is very literally no need to run out and buy the latest gadgets or the most expensive doodad or whatever. So I'm not going to try to sell you on the idea you need to do so. And that, in a nutshell, is why I don't try to sell people equipment. It's why, by and large, I don't do product reviews, I don't promote products. If I've used something and I found it to be a very good deal, very good quality and reasonably priced, sure, I'll let you know about it. But doing product reviews and selling you products, it's never going to be on the top of my list of things to do on this channel. So I've been saying that you don't need tip-top equipment to produce good images, and I want to demonstrate that. Over the course of this video, you have seen a number of astrophotography images pop up. I made all of them. Beginning at about 6.5 minutes, the first seven images were simply made with a doublet refractor and an uncooled planetary camera. That's all. And by my usual standards, they didn't even have much integration time, no more than one single night of exposure, and sometimes only a few hours. And all the images after that were just made with a Celestron C8 or 203mm aperture Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. And it's not the Edge telescope, it's just the ordinary Celestron C8. And a Player One Ares M camera, a mono camera with a 1 inch sensor. And in all cases, the reliable, old, and reasonably priced Skywatcher EQ6R mount was used. This is all moderately priced equipment at most, except for the planetary camera, which by the standards of astrophotography cameras was cheap. And I just put them up there to illustrate that, yeah, you can absolutely make good images without breaking the bank. And you don't need to buy the next thing all the time because, quite frankly, once I had the observatory built, and that's about two years now, I stopped buying equipment. I haven't bought anything in the last two years, and I don't plan to buy anything unless something breaks. I've been in photography well long enough to know the latest technology, the latest gimmick, isn't going to make me a better photographer. So save yourself some money, relax, be patient, get out there in the dark, watch the stars while you're imaging, have fun shooting those photographs. And if you have decent equipment and you've done a good alignment on a good mount, your images should turn out fine. Just develop them well. It can all be a very zen, very relaxing, very fun process without 
racking up a bunch of financial stress for yourself. So long as you have at least decent, serviceable equipment, the real key to good astrophotography is dark skies, lots of integration time, and good developing. And I'll stand by that statement. Pop over to the Sky Story Astro Bin and take a look around, because they were all made on that philosophy. Every image there was either made with the 8-inch schmidt Cassegrain telescope and the inexpensive Player One Aries M camera, or the doublet refractor and the planetary camera. And you can decide for yourself if you think those images turned out okay. Thank you for watching. Let me know if you have any thoughts or comments. Now, get out there and shoot that very wonderfully affordable sky.